right, we're going to start in a minute. If you all can make your way back to your seats, please. All right, I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce Mr. Fred Urbina. He currently serves as the Attorney General for the Pasquayaki tribe. He's practiced law or worked in the field of criminal justice, Indian law, and law enforcement for over 20 years. He's a veteran of the U.S. Army and is a third gen veteran. He was recently appointed to the Advisory Committee on Tribal and Indian Affairs for the Department of Veteran Affairs. He served as Associate Judge for the Pasquayaki Tribal Court and Assistant Attorney General for the Tohono O'odham Nation and pre previously served as a Deputy Associate Director of Tribal Justice Bureau, um, sorry, Support Office of Justice Services at the U.S. Department of Interior Bureau of Indian Affairs. He also serves as an Appalachian Court Judge for the Colorado River Indian Tribes and Alabama I uh, hope I'm saying this right, Kushota Tribe of Texas. Um, he also serves on the Arizona Study Committee on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, and he's been appointed to Governor Katie Hobbs' Arizona Task Force on Missing and Murdered Indigenous People. So we're very fortunate to have Mr. Urbina here. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Oh, thank you, Dr. Cordova Marx. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you all for having me here at the university. Um, this is a heavy topic. Um, like she said, my name is Fred Urbina. I'm the Attorney General for the Pascual Yaqui Tribe. Um, what I'll do today is kind of give a brief overview of some of the issues uh, we've been working on here in the state of Arizona. And um, kind of give an update on where the task force stands currently, but also give some history and some information about some of the study committees that came up prior to the current task force. <clears throat> so we'll just talk a little bit about um, some historical context to kind of put you in a place where, where we can imagine why things are actually happening. Um, and, and the historical context should actually, um, should not leave you with the question about why this is happening, but you should probably start, ask, start basically explaining that um, there is no reason why it shouldn't be happening because of our history, because of jurisdiction, and everything that we know about the place we call home here. We'll talk a little bit about some legislative advancements made um, through these study committees, and we'll talk a little bit about partnerships as well. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of frame it in the context of, of my tribe, the Pascual Yaqui tribe. Um, our first contact with non-Indians, with colonists, was in 1533 um, with the Spanish. And so um, it's been 500 years since the tribe has been uh, dealing with these issues, um, protecting our way of life. Um, and that goes, that's true for all tribes here in Arizona, as well as tribes across the nation. And so, this story does not start here, but it's certainly um, a flashpoint in history. For us, our creation story is a story about a talking tree. And the talking tree explained to uh, a young relative of ours, an ancestor, about all the things that were gonna be coming in the future all the strife, all the violence, um, the wars, the train, everything that would bring um, darkness and violence to our tribe. And our ancestors were given a choice, a choice to stay here 
or to go into the sea. Uh, the Yaquis that you see today chose to stay. But the prophecy of the talking tree was that all of this would be coming. Uh, all of this would be coming to us, uh, to our people in the future. Um, and so that is um, something that I know that other tribes have their own creation stories. Um, but this prophecy for us um, kind of told us what, was, what we'd be dealing with and that we'd have to be strong uh, if we were going to stay here uh, to deal with everything that we see today. Um, I mentioned, well, for us, we have tribal members and relatives who live um, on both sides of the border here on the northern end of that border um, that crossed our territory. Um, we're likely the only tribe in the United States that is um, that has not only been recognized by a federal government in two different places, but also have um, reservations and rights in both the US and Mexico. So before the border, we move freely back and forth, east and west, north and south. Um, for us here in the US, we have a small reservation southwest of where you currently are sitting. Um, we have a population of about 22,000 people um, and about a population of 6,000 on the reservation. Um, you know, the US Census tells us that there's about 500 non-Indians who live with us, um, and then about 900 folks that work in our government and our casino operations. And so, <clears throat> you know, they, they wanted to hang out with us in 1533, and they continue to want to hang out with us today. Um, and, but, you know, they're here, they're on our reservation, um, certainly. Um, as relatives, as people who work with us, and but these are some of the some of the things that um, create the problem we're talking about today. And of course, this would be the same for other tribes um, based on their own history. So I, I talk about colonial flashpoints to give context to what we're talking about um, because it sets the stage for what we see and for why we ask the question why. So it's very important to understand that um, when you're asking about reasons, um, we, we already know what they are. Just some historical context about where we are today. Um, here, you know, in, in Tucson at the University of Arizona, um, historically, uh, this is where indigenous people lived. Um, throughout history, you had several things that were happening, the coming of the Spanish, uh, the development of the missions, uh, the presidios. Um, if you think about um, just east of here um, is Fort Lowell. And most people know that as the park, right? Fort Lowell Park. But that was a presidio. And presidios and missions were not just um, outposts or historical ruins. They were places that were created to subjugate the population. And so they were bringing war along with other reasons, taking resources, um, you know, claiming land here in the desert southwest. So um, we think about this in terms of history, but sometimes we disconnect that history from what is happening today. Um, the US policy of manifest destiny, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the Gadsden Purchase of 1854, those all started um, the actual um, exchange of Spanish land grants to US land grants for parcels of land here in the Southwest. Um, the problem was there was still people here. 
um, that is a problem, especially if they're on choice land next to the flowing Santa Cruz River or the flowing San Pedro River. And so what do we have to do? We have to move these folks east, west, north um, in order to claim these lands. Um, that was done through federal policy. That was done by settlers here um, in the Tucson and Pima County region. As they set up their own governance, their governments, um, and as Arizona became a territory. So, you know, when you pass these historical markers, um, think about the connection and the reason why they were there and, and how that impacted what we're talking about today. Um, this is just a, de a depiction of what things look like in that time period and what it looks like today, the dispossession of Indian land and resources. The Homestead Act of 1862 and the Morrill Act of 1862 created a situation where um, former Indian land was basically uh, given to universities. Um, the University of Arizona is a land grant institute. And so the, the, the land that a lot of the, the different colleges sit on, um, they're there because of these federal acts, but they're also there um, on former Indian land, right? Indigenous land. Um, the US president at the time also had a policy of moving people onto reservations, both by peace and also by war. And so if you weren't gonna be peaceful and move on to a reservation, then that process would happen by war. And thousands of people died um, during this process. These reservations were not created to build thriving communities or even safe communities. Um, these reservations were created to move people and to assimilate them into the larger population. Um, here locally, the San Javier Reservation was created in 1874. And then um, during that time period from the 1850s through the 1910s, other reservations were created here in Arizona um, as people were moved off um, different areas of land. Around the same time frame, you have the boarding school era. You have boarding schools that were created as many as 408 boarding schools created across the nation where Indian children were removed from their families and placed in boarding schools. Um, many Indian children died during that process or while they were at the boarding schools. Here in Arizona, there was as many as 51 boarding schools. If you, if you drive west of here um, onto Ajo Road, uh, there was a boarding school there underneath uh, the Fry's Shopping Center at the corner of Ajo and I-19. Uh, there was a boarding school here locally that would take children in. So <clears throat> you start to kind of see a through line of federal policy and history and the displacement and movement of children in conjunction with the theft of land and resources. Um, and all of this was done by federal policy or military conflict. Um, you had the ending of the Apache Wars in the 1920s. At the time, there was still um, war happening in Mexico on the Yaqui people. And so there was movement of people, uh, there was still war happening um, just south of here, south of Nogales um, in Sonora. And so um, things didn't end there. It continues um, through the boarding school time frame and into the period of time where uh, the removal of children was done by state agencies through child welfare departments. 
That is continuing. Uh, that's continuing to happen. Um, in 1978, because of this problem, uh, the U.S. government created the Indian Child Welfare Act to address this issue. Many of you might have heard of the um, Brackeen case that recently came out favorably for tribes. Um, however, that was a direct result of this policy and the Indian Child Welfare Act that was put in place in 1978 to protect um, children, to keep them reunified with tribal families. And so all of these policy issues are connected um, historically to what we're experiencing today. Um, you had Arizona statehood in 1912, but you had all these things happening in the background to create what we're experiencing. Um, so you might see different definitions of missing and murdered indigenous people. Um, when people started to address this matter in 2016, 2015, um, the focus was on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. And so here in the state of Arizona, um, we have legislation that created a study committee in 2019. That study committee uh, focused on women and girls. And so there's a definition for missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. And then also uh, there's also developed um, after the fact in 2020, 2022, a realization from tribal communities that men were also going missing um, and LGBTQ relatives as well. And so the definition has, has uh, shifted uh, to include um, everybody that might be missing. And so <clears throat> the first part in 2019 was done through legislation. The next piece that we'll talk about um, was done through an executive order. Um, we ask why is this happening? Um, I think the better question is, you know, um, we know it's happening and uh, why wouldn't it be happening, essentially? Uh, because of all we know about history, jurisdiction, and the setup and makeup of how people address crime, uh, missing persons, um, sexual assault, violence against Native women and men, uh, when those things aren't addressed comprehensively by, by, by any jurisdiction, uh, we get what we're talking about today. We get a public safety and health crisis um, because of, of our history, because of the lack of jurisdiction for tribes to address violence, um, the, to punish offenders, and then the resources to um, address missing persons, um, human trafficking, um, everything that we might see um, where other communities might have other resources to address these problems. They're simply not available across Indian country and across the US. I talked about the uh, study committee that was created in 2019. Um, this was done um, after um, grassroots efforts um, created um, we, we actually had, I want to say, three or four Native American legislators that were working at the Capitol in Phoenix. They were elected and they were in their positions. An attorney who works with, with me, her name is Winona Benali Baldonegro, um, here in Arizona, um, basically saw these, um, these bills that were being created in places like Montana, and other states. And so we, we basically, she worked with her colleagues, other Native American legislators to draft a bill, HB 2570, to create this study committee. Um, this um, study committee, when it, when it came to a hearing, you had a lot of grassroots organizations that showed up um, and testified to um, these various House and Senate committees at the Capitol. This bill um, passed unanimously um, out of committee. 
It was signed by Governor Ducey, um, but it was created by tribal grassroots organizations along with tribal people who, are, who were working at the legislative body at the time. Uh, so um, the study committee was not funded as it probably should be, but it created um, what the current task force is currently doing. The field study was essentially created to collect information, uh, to speak to family members, to speak to survivors, um, and to put out a report. Um, but a, I mentioned that it wasn't funded as properly as it should have been. Uh, the funding for this uh, came from the Attorney General's office here in Arizona, and it funded um, some research. It funded the committee going from uh, different reservations to collect information. The problem, though, the problem we experienced uh, during the study committee time frame was COVID. And so if you all remember COVID, um, we had problems meeting in person uh, with survivors and essentially reservations were shut down because of the pandemic. And so for us, for members of the study committee, it was difficult to touch base with survivors. It was difficult to touch base with tribes um, because of the respect everybody had for um, the pandemic um, and the devastation it was having across um, each community. Um, this is a basically a timeline of, of, of what was, uh, how the process went. Um, LMA is a local, uh, research, research organization called um, LaCroix and Milligan Associates. They're located um, just west of here, but they essentially were received funding to help the committee put together the report. Um, <clears throat> also, while we were thinking about moving out and talking to tribes, we had to have like um, an agreement, a data agreement, an agreement between the state and the tribe to collect information, to talk to survivors, and respect the data sovereignty of those tribes. So that agreement was created um, and rolled out. A couple of tribes um, agreed to the agreement through tribal resolution, and then we were able to talk to survivors and families in some places. Uh, but it wasn't comprehensive and it wasn't, um, we weren't able to get out to each tribe because of what was happening at the time. There was some information collected, um, like what has been mentioned earlier, it's difficult to collect data. Um, our goal was to speak to not only tribal law enforcement agencies, but also um, municipal agencies, state agencies, and federal law enforcement agencies. Um, that was very difficult, um, gathering data. A lot, of, a lot of municipal agencies didn't have specific data broken out by tribe or by race. And so um, it was difficult to get even basic communication by state law enforcement agencies. Even though this is a study committee that was enacted by a state law to gather information. You, you think it would be easier to tell a state municipal law enforcement agency, hey, just send us your missing persons data so that we can include it in the report. Um, that wasn't so. <clears throat> so during this time frame, also, we, we, you know, when we were talking to families, um, the families were raising the issues of their missing uh, boys and men as well. And so that was something that we kind of noticed, and we noticed those numbers were higher um, in some places than uh, for indigenous females. So we contacted all 22 tribes to enter into MOUs. Um, we attempted follow-ups. This was pandemic timeframe. Um, we presented to tribal councils 
and um, eight MOUs were ultimately signed uh, with eight different tribal um, nations. And, you know, we were able to make contact with survivors and families, but this was done digitally. This was done through Zoom and Teams. These are all the law enforcement agencies we made contact with. Um, and interviews that we were able to obtain from these law enforcement agencies. I mentioned why the study was limited. Um, we talked about COVID, um, and then we talked also about the MOU process. Um, each different tribal government is different, and so their approval of an MOU between the state might take months, it could even take a year. And so if you've got a research time frame where you've got maybe a year, maybe two years, um, just the fact that you've got to negotiate an MOU so that they can protect their data um, is going to limit the time uh, for that agreement to, to materialize, but also then for you to do your work after the fact. So that has to be built in into future uh, for future considerations, um, what it would take to work with tribes to produce an MOU. And each of those MOUs are probably going to be different with each tribe that you deal with. So there was tribes that worked with us and we were able to move very quickly. Um, there was a lot of tribal leader support. Um, there was families that came forward, survivors, uh, that came forward and told their stories. And also there was law enforcement agencies that were able to work with us um, through this process and, and were interested in, in also addressing this issue. And that's important because we are, we are talking about the state. We are talking about a state law that affects um, tribal people. And so um, I think that's significant. I think it's important. I think I think it should be done. Uh, I think it should be something that um, should be automatic. It, it shouldn't require a law for this information to be shared or programs to be developed to address these problems. But when you think about our history and you think about relationships between states and tribes and the US federal government, that just hasn't been the case historically. So it's, it's a big hurdle to get over, but it's good to see um, when it happens. And if it's, if it's mildly successful, um, it's good to see. So shortly after that, um, they created a House Ad Hoc Committee. And so this was different than the legislation that was created in 2019. This was 2022, the House of Arizona basically developing an ad hoc interim committee to continue the work of the original study committee. The original study committee came out with 66 recommendations. That study is available on ASU's website. Um, they have a, a, a place called the Rove Lab. So that Rove Lab, you can find uh, copies of the study, digital copies of that study. Um, and you can kind of see the list of recommendations that, that were created by this, this uh, committee. Next came the House Ad Hoc Committee. Um, the committee was kind of meant to continue the same work that was being done, except it wasn't created by law. It was a committee function um, that the House um, gave authority to happen out of um, the House itself. That was a three or four month process um, and a series of hearings that happened um, at the Capitol. That committee came out with 83 recommendations. Those recommendations can be found at the link below. Um, they're similar to the first initial recommendations, but they're additional recommendations. The thing about this 
interim report was it came about um, like the end of the report when we submitted in December of 2022, um, we started to see another issue like pulse out um, and it was a sober living home issue. Um, so we started to get reports. We had survivors come to these hearings and report what was happening out in Phoenix and Tucson, or the fact that they were missing relatives and they were being taken from the reservation um, and brought to these sober living homes. And there was several deaths that had occurred um, by relatives who were in these homes, uh, essentially trafficked from the reservation, moved to sober living homes, and that created a situation where you had um, unregulated entities using tribal members to bill Medicaid, which is here in Arizona, it's called access. So it was fraudulent billing by these sober living homes uh, for services they weren't providing to vulnerable tribal members, both male and female. Um, and that includes all tribes. Um, I know that the impact across Arizona, um, just in, in people that we, we understand have been impacted, uh, the number is in the thousands. And so these are people that were taken primarily from the reservation and brought to sober living homes. Um, some abuse happened in those homes, sexual assaults, and also deaths. And so the House Ad Hoc Committee heard about this and that essentially has been what Arizona has been focused on during 2023. So you might have seen news articles about it. You might have seen reports about it. Um, those cases are still being investigated. Those cases are being uh, brought in different courts. People are being prosecuted uh, for that activity. And tribes are still trying to locate relatives that were in these sober living homes and impacted by this um, state systemic problem. And so this is another example of a state system like the child welfare system, like the federal boarding school system that has impacted um, reservations. So um, in 2023, Governor Hobbs established the uh, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Peoples Task Force, um, appointed 15 members to the task force by executive order. And so this was a recommendation from the previous report that went out um, so that she can continue this work for the next few years. I mentioned it's a 15 member task force made up of uh, community members, tribal leaders, um, law enforcement personnel to continue this work into up into and up to uh, 2026. Uh, the objectives is to continue to collect data, review policies and make, make recommendations. Um, the committee is broken up into working groups, working groups that are uh, health, judicial, uh, policy and tribal components. Each of those working groups are responsible to collect information and, and to develop policy recommendations for the governor uh, so that a report can be generated here in the near future. Um, this is another step, uh, an executive level step that Arizona is doing um, to address MMIP. And so the Governor's Office of Tribal Relations um, is the point on this. There is an MMIP coordinator. Uh, she's a colleague, Valora, who's actually uh, the point on this, she's Hopi. Her background is she's a former uh, victim advocate for the BIA, uh, working violent crime in and for metro and rural tribes in Arizona. So she is organizing this task force for the governor from the Capitol. I think that's important because uh, you have a tribal member who's located at the Capitol at the ninth floor with the governor, with the governor's office of tribal relations to address this matter. 
um, with funding. Um, the interesting about this is that currently um, the Arizona legislative body is, is contemplating um, the governor's office of tribal relations. So what they're doing is, is um, it's supposed to be created and funded by Arizona. Um, that bill has not been brought up um, in committees um, because of politics. So the governor's office of tribal relations could likely be um, it could it could likely be defunded as early as July. And so that's an issue that is front in mind for this process. But because this was created by executive order, even if it's not continued by the Arizona, Arizona legislative body, it's likely to continue um, with through executive power um, by the governor's office. Here's some legislative advancements that have been created by and specifically through the um, both of the study, the initial study committee recommendations and also the ad hoc committee recommendations in 2019 and 2022. So all of these things have happened because of the efforts initially by grassroots organizations in Arizona. Um, it's been done either through executive order, by um, state law to address these recommendations. And so has there been has there been success or uh, progress? Yes, there, ha there has. Um, obviously, this isn't all of the 66 recommendations or the 83 recommendations, but it is progress. Um, in a time where it's difficult to get um, you know, two political parties working together on, on issues that are important. And so this, this to me is progress. Um, it's not enough. But there has been some some actually actual reforms. Most recently, um, the sober living home issue. There was a bill that was drafted, and that went through both House and Senate, and was recently signed by the governor to address the sober living home issue. And so that um, is another legislative advancement that has happened um, in the past few months. So. Um, even though there's political strife and you know disagreements on everything, there are still some things that people um, are agreeing on and actually working on uh, so that we can address this comprehensively. There's some efforts that are happening federally. Uh, Operation Lady Justice, Savannah's Act, and the Not, In Not Invisible Act are happening um, on the federal level. They have produced reports and recommendations as well. Um, these efforts were started in the Trump administration um, by the leadership of uh, Deb Holland. And uh, there's been some significant um, developments and work that has been done um, federally and reports that have been created. Um, probably not enough though, in my humble opinion. Um, the DOJ Missing and Murdered Indigenous Persons Initiative was created in 2019. Uh, you see William Barr up here. Um, he went up to Alaska. Um, this is at the Flathead Indian Reservation in Pablo, Montana. Um, there are MMIP coordinators, federal coordinators here and across the country. You have FBI rapid deployment teams and you have data that's being crunched, um, programs that are being changed, uh, a program called NamUs um, is where you report missing relatives. That uh, program has been modified um, and additional missing people have been uh, submitted through NamUs through the work that's being done federally. <clears throat> There's coordinators, like I mentioned, in different states. Um, you know, from the task force perspective, uh, from the perspective of tribal prosecutors, um, this isn't enough. Um, for us, what we've seen here is we've seen some focus on, on um, cold cases. 
We've seen focus on cold cases, but not really everything else. And so there have been there have been success in in finding some and, and actually prosecuting some cases, uh, but it's not enough for the numbers that we're talking about across the country. There's um, these FBI rapid deployment teams are supposed to help tribes create um, what's called carts. And that's when a person goes missing, these teams would actually be developed at the grassroots level with the tribal government to create a mechanism to find and search for people. Um, here in Arizona, there's only one team that's been created. That's on the Navajo Nation. Uh, I don't know of any other um, any other tribes that have developed um, these teams just yet, these carts. And this is the tribal community response team. This is what I was talking about. Um, this is how it would work. This is how it would be set up to find missing people. Um, this was supposed to be rolled out and, and essentially led by the Department of Justice. Here locally, it would be the US attorney. Um, that hasn't happened across Arizona Indian Country at this point. For us on our reservation, uh, you would have different, uh, different law enforcement agencies that we work with, that we have agreements with. Uh, some of the things we'd have to think about is working with our federal partners, the FBI, the BIA, the U.S. Marshal Services, um, even CBP because of our connection uh, with the border and our relatives in Mexico. And that's basically an overview of what's happening in this space. Um, you know, for, from my perspective, um, the problem that, that I see happening is essentially the lack of jurisdiction for tribal courts and tribes generally. Um, right now, there's three tribes in Arizona that are prosecuting non-Indian offenders of domestic violence, um, Pascual Yaqui, Salt River, and Gila River. The other tribes are not, are not exercising jurisdiction, valid jurisdiction to prosecute domestic violence cases. Um, domestic violence cases, if they're not addressed properly, they fester, they become more violent, and they lead to cases of missing people and homicide. And so if you're not, if you're not protecting people um, and you're not addressing low level violence, um, domestic violence, harassment, and you're not enforcing orders of protection, um, this causes the problems we currently see. Um, part of the issue is, is um, and the problem with, with jurisdiction being restored it's a federal issue. Um, the federal government in 2013 and also um, 2022 has expanded tribal restored jurisdiction. Basquiaki is exercising that jurisdiction currently so we can address this problem locally on our reservation. Um, I talked about, well, there's federal case declinations. Um, there's inadequate sentencing authority for tribal um, justice systems. If the tribe does not address these cases, it's not going to be addressed by the federal government and it's not going to be addressed by the state. And so ultimately, if it's not being addressed by either jurisdiction, um, we're seeing these problems uh, and the problems grow and the cases grow and the impact to the community and our public health um, is damage and that has been happening for decades. So imagine where you live currently, whether you live off reservation or on reservation, imagine being able or not being able to call the police and knowing that there's gonna be justice for you or your family. Imagine your, your sister or your daughter or your mother being sexually assaulted and that case never, um, having any type of justice. Um, you know, sometimes we don't think about it as we go about our daily lives, um, how, you know, we don't think about our safety. You know, it's, it's, it's something we take for granted. Um, but on reservations, 
um, where you can't take that for granted, um, it's a problem. And, you know, for, for those of us who don't live where justice is absent, it's hard to imagine. But just imagine your own neighborhood. What would happen to your neighborhood if that was something that you couldn't address? What would your neighborhood look like in 10 years? What would your mental health be like in 20 years? What would your family be like in three decades? Would you move? Would you feel safe? Would you be healthy? Would you have addictions? Would you have suicides? What would your community look like? And, um, and that's, that's within a span of three or four decades, five decades, six decades. So that's what we're talking about. Um, tribes can exercise their sovereignty to address this problem. Um, that's the ultimate, in my view, the ultimate answer is, is strong tribal justice systems addressing these problems locally. Um, it's not gonna happen through the US Attorney's Office. It's not gonna happen by the state of Arizona. It's gonna happen by tribal leadership, exercising sovereignty with a strong tribal court system. Um, that's how you're gonna keep your community safe. Um, this is a roadmap on federal legislation that has been developed over the past, well, since 2008. Uh, the Bosco Yaqui tribe has implemented each of these provisions to protect people on our reservation. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. It's gonna be a 10 or 20 year process for you to do all of this, to manage sex offenders, to prosecute non-Indian offenders, to prosecute violent offenders, and then to have the technology and the court system to be able to do all this while having people um, serving out sentences and, and being able to pay for that and address that. And so, um, you know, you can do this, tribes can do this. Um, the problem is the lack of resources and the lack of capacity. Um, if you do this, you reduce the level of violence on reservations um, and the likelihood of people going missing and murdered. We had a meeting um, at the Bosco Yaki Reservation I want to say one month ago, and it was a presentation by law enforcement to the to the task force. And essentially the task force heard that the Pasco Yaqui Reservation, the Pasco Yaqui tribe do not have any currently currently listed persons as missing. And that that includes several different databases. Um, that's not to say it hasn't happened in the past or is not likely to happen in the future, um, but that's presently what, what is happening on our reservation. We do have the occasional homicide uh, that happens on our reservation, but those, res those homicides are investigated and prosecuted. Um, and, and sometimes we get the outcome we want, sometimes we don't. Uh, but those cases are being addressed um, and that's what's actually happening. Um, and, and I think in part uh, because of the implementation of restored jurisdiction and the ability to criminally prosecute violent offenders. And there's a lot of factors that we need to think about when we're thinking about this issue. Um, when we talk about housing and we talk about the ability to house people on reservations, um, you know, families, you know, live in multi-generational households. That's not always because of culture. It's because of the lack of housing also. And so you have people moving from reservation to the county proper because of a lack of housing. And so you have that crime moving back and forth also. And so these are just some issues that um, are part of the overall problem that we see when we see these issues happening. Uh, human trafficking is a problem. Human trafficking is something that people um, know it's happening. Um, we know it's happening, but there's not a whole lot of data connected to trafficking. Two days ago, I got a frantic phone call when I was on my way home from work. 
and it was a colleague from uh, the Tanatha Nation. And she said, hey, I just talked to a mother. She was doing a presentation in Tucson and she said her, her child was taken from her. And, um, and this happened while she was in treatment. And the, these parties that took her child left the state. Uh, she tried to report this to Pima County, to the city of Tucson, and also to the tribal nation um, through child welfare authorities and to everybody she could think of, and nobody could help her. Number one, they didn't believe her because she just came out of treatment. Number two, they didn't, you know, the, the thought process was, well, maybe the child is in the child welfare system and that's where the child belongs. And so, so right away you have state agencies who were not able to, they actually told her, go back to the reservation, even though she lives in Tucson. And so that, that singular case is, is still trying to be addressed by people that are trying to help this mother. Um, but it's just a, a small example of what happens when people move back and forth from the tribal reservation to the state and how state authorities are equipped to handle these problems. I'm not sure about the outcome at this point. I'll follow up with her and see what's happening. But it's, it's just a small example that happens daily that we will never hear about. You'll never see this on Dateline. You'll never hear um, the local news talk about these cases uh, because it's, it just doesn't happen. Um, and it's not something that they're going to be reporting on and even tracking. And so this is essentially how tribes are addressing MMIP. Um, it's resource intensive. Uh, you need to have the capacity to do these things. And, um, you know, some tribes are able to do this. Uh, some tribes just don't have the capacity to put programs into place uh, to address this issue comprehensively. Uh, so you're going to see, like, basically some tribes doing it a little more because they have additional resources. Some tribes just aren't going to be able to do this, and they're going to be relying on the federal government or the state of Arizona to address these problems as their people go missing and as people are murdered. Um, these are our VAWA cases. Um, I talked about non-Indian people who live on our reservation. Um, this is, um, so our tribe has been prosecuting non-Indian offenders of domestic violence for 10 years. Um, 10 years, it's been 100 plus cases. Um, this data might be a little stale, but um, for us, we knew that this was a problem and we knew that this problem was happening. These non-Indian offenders were, were, were violently attacking tribal members on our reservation in tribal housing. Um, that was identified, we've addressed it, we're able to address it every single day. Um, they're prosecuted, they're investigated by tribal police, they're prosecuted by tribal prosecutors, and they're sent to jail by tribal judges. Our tribal judges, our justice system. Um, and so I, I tell people to take these, you know, we have a small reservation, small population on reservation. What if you took these cases for 22 tribes and multiplied these cases for each tribe in Arizona? I'm not a math major, but extrapolate that out to Arizona for 10 years. What does that number look like? Um, those are victims, those are families, those are people that are dealing with this every day. Because we know it was happening on our reservation, it's likely to happen on those reservations. And if you do the math, um, this is what it looks like in Arizona, uh, especially in, on tribes that aren't addressing it. So um, just to, just to kind, of, a kind of, to give like a, a snapshot of what might be happening, um, when you think about non-Indian offenders. Um, so this is a subset of our DV cases. And then we have another set of cases that 
are produced by tribal males and females. Tribal violent offenders, tribal male and female violent offenders. This is a subset of non-Indian offenders. So it's important to make that distinction that it's not only happening by non-Indian offenders, but also tribal offenders. Um, you know, people ask about all the different factors that we should be thinking about. What is, what is the biggest factor when we talk about this issue? What is the biggest factor? My, my question to you. What's the biggest factor? Substance use? Anybody else? That's the biggest factor? Anybody else? Poverty? In their thoughts? I think it's men. <clears throat> I think it's men. I, we don't talk about it. I look at the audience and I know that there's men in the audience, but I know that a lot of the leaders who are trying to address this are women. A lot of the survivors that are speaking for their family are women. Um, you know, men aren't talking about this and men aren't changing it or working with grassroots organizations to do this. There are people out there that are, but I think it's the biggest factor. I grew up in a, in a household where I watched my mother um, um, assaulted nightly. Um, and, and, you know, the, 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 <clears throat> The thing I remember is, is me and my brothers wanting to kill my dad. So, but he's the one that I learned how to um, be in relationship, right? Um, that's what I saw. That's what, um, I don't know if it's, it's kind of pushed me to kind of to, in this direction, but, um, and you know, if you grow up in a household like that, you don't talk about this. You don't, um, you know, talk about anything else. Um, my mom, she's, she's now suffering with dementia and she's lost a lot of her memory, but she's happy because she doesn't remember the bad stuff. So she wakes up with a smile. She wakes up humming. And, you know, she's not recalling all the bad things that happened. Maybe, maybe that's the good thing about Alzheimer's or I don't know that she has maybe a window of time where she is, um, you know, she's at least got some semblance of happiness when she wakes up in the morning. Um, and sometimes I think maybe that dementia was was due to the to the assaults that she experienced from my dad, you know, uh, to her brain. So um, I I just um, I, I want to end and in, in, in say that I think that there is hope. I think that um, I think that. Change is happening slowly. It's not fast enough for families. It's not fast enough for survivors. It's not fast enough for people who are missing relatives. Um, I think it's an injustice to our communities. It's an injustice to our families. And I think more needs to be done. But I, I honestly believe that things are happening um, here in Arizona on the task force. I'm, I'm happy to serve on that task force. And I believe that um, we'll be able to make additional changes um, here in the near future. And I, I want to thank uh, Dr. Cord
Cordova Marks for inviting me today and, and giving me the opportunity to speak to you um, and, and talk to you a little bit about what's happening. I'll entertain any questions you might have um, about what we talked about. Thank you. 